Good evening, Dungeon Masters, I'm Baron Durop. Something I frequently discuss on this channel is how video games can teach us a number of lessons to improve our dungeon mastering skills. And while that's absolutely true, it doesn't mean that everything about video games translates well to the tabletop genre. In fact, there are a number of habits I see Dungeon Masters pick up from video game design that reinforces a poor tabletop experience. In any typical video game, ranging from RPGs to first-person shooters, the combat-oriented game loop, or rather, the repetitive action of fighting a team of enemies, is almost always front and center in these games. These combat encounters provide the tactile foundation that the rest of the game is built on. For example, think of your most recent playthrough of Fallout or Skyrim. How many bandits might your character neutralize while traveling from one quest location to the next? Furthermore, video game characters typically regenerate their health quickly in between each run-in with these combatant NPCs. While it might be fun to circle strafe around a few bad guys and loot their gear after each encounter in a video game, these kinds of combats are quickly perceived as boring and lackluster at the tabletop. Unfortunately, the addition of short rests into 5th edition would indicate that the game developers intended to mimic these kinds of quick recovery combat encounters. However, these low-stakes encounters simply grind the game's pace to a halt, and seldom add any narrative value. Instead, when using combat encounters to add interest to overland travel, for example, focus on using these opportunities to add to the narrative and teach players about what wild animals and factions are in the region, and what problems these factions face. Poachers hunting for game have a very different story to tell than some soulless bandits, after all. Part of any good dungeon crawler video game, like Legend of Zelda, are the various silly puzzles which need to be solved to progress through the dungeon. Pushing blocks, flipping switches, toggling levers, all of these things are fun to figure out within the context of a video game. However, at the table, these contrived puzzles are more likely to stump players than not, or at least will only be interesting to one or two of your players at the table. While your jigsaw enthusiast is brute forcing the correct arrangement of sliding statues on a raised platform, everyone else will be endlessly scrolling social media. However, if some kind of clear risk or danger is present, the puzzle takes on a whole new form. In its most rudimentary solution, which was commonly used by old-school dungeon designs from the 70s, rolling for a random encounter each time the party makes noise or takes a considerable amount of time tinkering with a puzzle is one way to bake in that risk, but don't stop with monsters just lurking in the shadows. Environmental timers, like filling a room with sand or putting the players inside a Star Wars trash compactor, are all great examples of threats which apply a time crunch before something really bad happens. When it's extremely apparent to the players that the puzzle is hostile, or at least that not having a solution is dangerous, the players will be more motivated to work together and solve the issue in front of them. Before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to thank this video's sponsor- Oh, hold on just one second. Dow's Gear Estate, this is the Baron speaking. Hey dude, how's it going? Have you heard about this uh, drama with the Lordship titles going on? Oh, hey Narb. Um, yeah, I've heard about it. What's up? Some YouTubers claiming it's a big scam and the internet's upset. Uh, the company's gearing up for a lawsuit now. It's, it's a whole ordeal. Ugh, that sounds like a big mess. But it does give me an idea. Oh yeah? Yeah, as nobility, I can't offer lordship or anything, only a monarch can do that. But I can organize members into the Livonian Order of the Sword. It was a military order my family founded in 1204. That's it. Wait, what? You hung up on me. How would you like to join me on a reforestation crusade? I've created a new tier on my Patreon to join the Livonian Sword Order, the proceeds of which will be donated to the Arbor Day Foundation. Those who become Patreon supporters at this tier will receive a declaration of your Livonian Sword Order membership, sealed in wax with my very own signet, as well as the signet of the Livonian Sword Order. This document will grant you bragging rights to a fake membership of the Livonian Sword, a military order that technically dissolved in 1237. But 
there's more. You'll also get a 28 millimeter miniature of the Livonian Sword Paladin, designed by Bright Miniatures and kitbashed by Narb Makes, as well as some Dungeon Masterpiece dice, which are still in production and I don't have any photos of them just yet, so here's some spec art and some AI rendered images of what they will look like. By the way, the footage you were seeing earlier is from an old Soviet propaganda film called Alexander Nevsky, which depicts my ancestors as the bad guys. I love how Conan the Barbarian's costume design was inspired by characters in that film. Anyway, if you'd like to join the Livonian Sword Order and pick up your very own Paladin miniature, as well as some Dungeon Masterpiece dice, join my Patreon at the Sword Order tier in the link in the description below. If none of that sounds interesting to you, but you'd still like to help the Arbor Day Foundation's reforestation efforts, then please check out the donation link and give charity directly to the Foundation itself. Thanks everyone for supporting our woodland ecosystems, and now back to the video. One of the most problematic false lessons a new dungeon master takes from video games is that every problem should have a predefined solution. From dialogue choice selection to finding the right series of attacks for defeating a boss monster to hitting the right switches with the right weapon in the right order, the finite problems we encounter in video games frequently have solutions which have been predetermined by the game's developers. Obviously, figuring out these puzzles in a video game can be quite fun. However, in D&D, DMs who develop predetermined solutions to the problems they create rob the players of their autonomy to create solutions on their own. Solutions which might have even been better than whatever contrived idea the DM had come up with to start with. To fix this bad habit, focus on creating the problem only, and sit back and watch the players come up with an interesting solution all on their own. Inadvertently, this fix solves two problems at the same time. It can dramatically reduce prep time since you aren't concerning yourself with how a puzzle or NPC interaction needs to be resolved, but also grants autonomy back to the players. Modern RPGs typically scale the game's difficulty to match the advancement and power level of the character, and within the context of a video game, this is ideal. The magic sauce of the game loop itself requires enemies to maintain the same threat level as the player gains more damage output and durability. However, the degree to which this happens in modern video games implicitly sets freshman dungeon masters on a fruitless endeavor. It's easy to be tricked into believing perfect encounter balance is a goal to strive for. Worse Still, Wizards of the Coast offers a sham of a tool for accomplishing this goal, challenge rating in the XP budget. And while some semblance of fair encounter design is important, sure, the degree to which the encounter balance is an issue for a game of Dungeons & Dragons is far less important than in a video game, where health and mana bars rapidly refill, and repetitive combat is the most central part of the game. Since tabletop RPGs don't necessarily dictate combat as the focus of these encounters, even if they often do, players should feel empowered or perhaps even desperate to resolve problems through dialogue when encountering overpowered or underpowered enemies. There is nothing wrong with dropping an adult green dragon in front of a level 2 party and pressing them into a terrifying conversation. Similarly, throwing a single kobold against a level 10 party might allow the players to reverse that role and use and abuse the kobold into favors and information. Skyrim especially, but really all of the modern Elder Scrolls dungeon designs do a very good job of using a linear dungeon layout. In fact, one of the easiest ways to get yourself unlost in one of these dungeons, if for some reason you do get turned around, is to wander around until you find a dead body and then head in the opposite direction. Additionally, these dungeons usually have what I call a Skyrim backdoor, where after overcoming the dungeon's central issue, the player throws a switch and opens a door that leads them right back to the entrance of the dungeon, thereby preventing the need to backtrack. But keep in mind that these video game dungeons are specifically designed this way so that game developers can create a highly curated story for the players to bumble their way through. In D&D, this is fine for smaller three-room dungeons, but in larger dungeon expanses, this kind of layout where one room simply follows the next robs players of any choice or authority in how they explore the dungeon and solve the encounters. If there is only ever one door to advance through, the traps, guards, and alarms are obviously only ever going to be set on that given door, and the players won't have opportunity to sneak around from a different angle or find alternative routes through the dungeon complex. 
I'm sure there are other bad habits dungeon masters pick up from video games that I didn't include in this video, so add more that you can think of in the comments down below. If you'd like to help the Arbor Day Foundation and get some Dungeon Masterpiece swag, please consider joining my Patreon at the Livonian Sword Order tier. Thanks for watching, Dungeon Masters, and until next time, good night.